Good morning. We have another fireside chat for you. Um, Macon Delarim was confirmed as the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust Division since September in September 2017. I've known Macon since he was uh, the Chief Counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. One of the great things about working with Macon early in his career was he actually has a bit of a tech background, so you didn't have to explain a lot of things to him that other staff were not focusing on. But when you look at his bio, you realize this is somebody who's been very focused in what they want to be doing in his life. He has a rich antitrust background. He's covered the full range of industry issues, institutions touched upon by the work of antitrust. He's a former partner at Brownstein Hyatt Farber in LA where he worked on IP issues and he has served in the antitrust division from 2003 to 2005 as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General where he was overseeing the appellate, the foreign commerce, and the legal policy section. He also played an integral role in the building of the antitrust division engagement with the international counterparts and was involved in civil and criminal matters in that area. He has served as the attorney general on the task force for intellectual property and chairman of the um, merger working group for international competition network. As I said, he's been very focused. He's going to be joined by Ted Johnson, who is the variety uh, senior editor. I'm really impressed that variety actually has a full-time person in Washington. I was just asking him, I was like, I feel like there's so much fodder in DC that you could just be feeding back to, you know, um, directors and, and producers. But the, you know, you always notice when somebody tries to do a DC based show that after about two sessions, they're like, they're really they're going at this the wrong way, so maybe they have some things for us. Um, he's also the host of uh, SiriusXM's Weekly Pop Politics, and he is the regular contributor to Politico, so be watching for him there, and the creator of Variety's uh, policy or um, politics website. So please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Ted Johnson and Megan Delreem. Well, thank you for being here. Ted Johnson from Variety, and great to be here with Macon Del Rahim, Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division. I wanted to just start because uh, we're just coming off a government shutdown. Uh, what was the impact, and are you now in a period of playing catch up? Uh, so, the impact on the critical cases was minimal. We had to prioritize uh, the deadlines that we had. So, for mergers and deadlines that were statutory, um, we continued on. There was some minor impact with some of our civil cases. Uh, some of our speeches and other uh, policy matters were on hold. Our criminal program and enforcement continued on uh, largely. Um, and a couple of matters like CBS Edna, which is its settlement is pending in the district court here. Um, we had an order from the judge to continue working on that to meet certain deadlines in February. So uh, that, that, that worked. Uh, the, probably the biggest impact was, I think, the anxiety for the staff, which was unfortunate, um, and uh, the hardship that some of them uh, had felt. And in about 40% of the division who continued to work without pay for a couple of weeks. For us, it was a, it was a lot less painful than some of the other parts of the government. We have a special funding arrangement because of our merger filing fee. So our funding didn't actually run out till January 4th. Um, and our folks only pay, missed the one pay period, which was this past Saturday. So it was minimal, but not knowing when it was gonna end certainly caused some anxiety for a lot of our staff. Wanted to also uh, address a recent news report in the New York Times. This is that Facebook is planning to integrate its uh, instant messaging services. It got the attention of some lawmakers on Capitol Hill uh, who said that uh, this actually uh, raises some competition issues. And I just wanted to ask you, are you concerned? What are your concerns? I read the report. I'm just not very familiar with exactly what it means. Uh, the consolidation within the company itself, it doesn't trigger any merger review laws um, to the extent that somehow integrating the platforms might increase certain levels of market power that could cause anti-competitive harm would be an area 
for antitrust enforcers to look at. I'm just not familiar. We have to be careful in this area to make sure that uh, you know, our enforcement actions um, are appropriately measured. And uh, so we'll, we'll watch it with interest, but I'm just not familiar enough with the specifics of what that integration means. But as far as you know, integrating several folks, that does not trigger Hart Scott Rodino. They're the same firm. And um, it, it, within the same firm, you can consolidate different assets. Now I'm going to go to uh, one of the uh, cosmic questions <laughs> of the day. Uh, you, hear, uh, you hear it for, on Capitol Hill now from the left and the right. And uh, William Barr in his confirmation hearings uh, was asked about it. This is uh, how did tech get so big? Uh, his quote is, I don't think big is necessarily bad, but I think a lot of people wonder how such huge behemoths that now exist in Silicon Valley have taken shape under the nose of antitrust enforcers. So from your standpoint, how did these platforms get so big? Well, you know, it's, it's tough to disagree with the attorney, former Attorney General Barr and soon to be Attorney General Barr. Uh, that I'm glad that, you know, uh, I think most people recognize that big necessarily isn't bad. In fact, in a, in a, at least in a capitalist system, uh, you want people to strive to continue to gain market share and compete in order to get that. And that's where consumers ultimately benefit and production goes up. Uh, how some of these firms have gotten big, uh, some of it has been with mergers and acquisitions uh, in the past. I, I, I think I read uh, someplace that maybe Facebook had had 77 transactions in recent years. Um, others have also grown through those types of acquisitions, but some of it has also been by giving a product that consumers want. Uh, whether or not, for, for our purposes, it, the question is, does that market power sustainable? Is there a market force that constrains that, that, uh, their ability to increase prices to whomever ultimately is their customer? There's a lot of discussion about, oh, these are free products, and antitrust law should apply a certain way or doesn't apply, or the, the old antitrust rules should not apply. Well, we've had a lot of experience with free products in the past. Uh, the laws do apply, and they should continue to apply the way they have, um, ultimately with the consumer welfare standard. Uh, by free products, I mean broadcast television has been free. It's been ad-supported. Uh, when we do antitrust analysis, we look at the, you know, the ad rates, the spot ad rates, and other uh, ways. But the, ultimately, the viewer is part of the product. As the eyeball, so you try to make better programming, this is broadcast now, better programming to attract more users by which you can charge higher advertising rates. You know, uh, in some ways, Google isn't too different than that. You try to pass on a product, but ultimately that consumer is not the customer of that product. It is the advertisers who buy on that platform. And so we have to take a look uh, about the impact, not only on price and output, but choice, uh, consumer choice that, that they could provide. You talk to people in the broadcast business and they will say, hey, uh, Google is five times the size of our company and the difference is we're heav heavily regulated and they are not. Uh, we hear that all the time in mergers of broadcasters. Uh, most recently, we've had, we've had to review several of them, Sinclair Tribune being one, now next to our Tribune and, uh, and others. It's, it's an important issue that they raise is, uh, you know, the advertising uh, factors, the, 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 com the competition for those advertising dollars of the local uh, car dealer or the local service provider that, that uses the local news channels and programming for those broadcast um, stations. Uh, how has that changed? Uh, how should we factor into our merger analysis uh, for those? We, I think those are important questions. Uh, we plan and shortly we'll be announcing um, a two-day workshop looking specifically at the impact of online advertising with broadcast television and, uh, and seeing how that market, whether or not we can learn more about what factors we should consider and whether or not our analysis in those markets should change. 
Do you, you've talked in the past about how there has been kind of this consensus over the past 30 years, maybe 40 years over antitrust enforcement. Uh, do you see that changing? After all, we have the FTC looking at uh, the antitrust laws and certainly on Capitol Hill, it's not just Democrats, you also have Republicans now mm -hmm. raising a lot of these antitrust concerns. Are we looking at a scenario where the laws will change or the means of enforcement will change? Well, the laws themselves, as Congress writes them, I think, could change if, if Congress passes those laws. I mean, I mean do you see momentum you see the for momentum. that? Yeah. Um, on the margins, I mean, so there's improvements you can make uh, in, in certain areas, and that, I think, that is legitimate, and we constantly do those. Uh, the, the, as far as the overall debate that's going on, and I'm glad that it's a bipartisan debate. Uh, there are conservatives and progressives who both think that you know, we should take a fresh look, as they have in the past. I think that consensus about the consumer welfare standard, ultimately, what is the goal of antitrust? Is to protect competition, not competitors. And it's ultimately, you want to be sure that the, the, that, that the competition is there to drive the market, to drive uh, the price control, rather than government stepping in to pick winners or losers or just determining what price is the right price. And uh, it's always good to constantly examine to see if we need to change laws. Have we learned more from new economic thinking, new business models? We have business models today that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. So how does that affect, you know, are there, with, with the advent of, you know, two-sided markets? We've had two-sided markets in the past. Some people would think newspapers with the classified ads were one form of two-sided markets, shopping centers but we're seeing more and more of them impacting every one of our lives. And how does that, uh, how should antitrust affect that? Uh, late Judge Bork with his seminal uh, book, The Antitrust Paradox in 1979, uh, really laid the groundwork for, by bringing in some principled neutral uh, uh, guidelines for how antitrust should operate. And I think there's that consensus around that but one thing he did say, he said that the, the, you know, our economic thinking will change and therefore our enforcement will continue to change. He was a big advocate of antitrust action in 20 years ago in Microsoft and he wrote a great uh, editorial uh, in May of 1998 in the New York Times describing what is antitrust. So I think that will continue, but I don't think there's gonna be a wholesale change of the antitrust laws. I think you have consensus largely not only uh, uh, amongst uh, enforcers in the United States, but uh, internationally about what the ultimate goal should be. Tim Wu uh, has written uh, essentially pinning the blame on uh, he hesitant enforcers of the past. Do you agree? The, it, when we're talking about tech yeah. platform. No, I, and I, and I res Dominance. like and respect him uh, quite a bit. He's very thoughtful and I think folks like him and others who continue to add to our thinking, Einar L. Haig up in, at Harvard and others, uh, continue to uh, inform our views. Um, I don't know if I would agree with that, partly because I don't know, I'm not privy to the facts and the economics of some of those past mergers. It's really easy to say that you know, Facebook and, and Instagram uh, should have never been, al been allowed to merge and they should be competing today. I asked a question, you know, we can't look at it 10 years later. Maybe we should look and do a retrospective of some of these transactions. I think that would be useful. But we can't go back to say, what was that? Because the information, the product back then was totally different. Would Instagram be what it is today had it not merged with Facebook? Would Google, uh, you know, Google, and I've heard the other one, we should you know, step in and break up Google and YouTube. Um, that might have some you know, public appeal today. The problem is, would YouTube be what it is today without the investment, the, the, the search engine, um, the, capa the technical capabilities that was provided to YouTube when Google bought them? Um, I don't know the answers to those, but those are the important questions to ask, because we may not have had what we have today uh, had those transactions not occurred. And that's sometimes the pro-competitive benefits of mergers. Uh, despite the fact that later on we might criticize those transactions and combinations. When you're talking about these tech platforms, what 
what will raise red flags for you? Well, certainly if they're taking a, any kind of activity that is preventing new competition to the market where they have market power, that would raise a red flag, I think, for almost anybody uh, should. Uh, and I'm not one of those who thinks, you know, somehow the, any enforcement of the antitrust laws is uh, interference in business and it's the anti-laissez-faire approach. I actually do believe strongly in enforcement, timely enforcement of the antitrust laws, but it's got to be appropriate. It can't be for the purposes of, oh, this person is too big, or somehow, you know, we need to let these competitors win um, because it would be better to have two. It may not be better to have two in some markets. Uh, if, if there's not the ability to withhold competition. So uh, I think new entrants are really important. Uh, a good analogy, not necessarily the best analogy today, but good analogy is exactly what the DC Circuit held Microsoft had violated, not to pick on them, but when they were trying to prevent the browser from gaining market share, uh, the reason why that was important was applications programmers could now write to a browser and be read by any computer rather than to the operating system alone. And those efforts by Microsoft is what was held to have violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act. I want to uh, bring up a uh, pending merger right now, Sprint and T-Mobile. Uh, I think you've been hesitant to say anything about uh, in existing review, but can you say anything about the timing when we can expect a decision? Um, the, you know, I think some timing is looking at the FCC because they have more uh, uh, strict guidelines for their reviews. We are trying to move ahead. We, you know, our, our review continued through the shutdown because of some deadlines and some information we had. So it, we didn't shut down the review of that during the uh, three weeks that we were um, uh, in the lapse appropriations mode. We uh, are, you know, we're working um, as fast as we can. It will end when it ends. Um, that's about as all I can say. Uh, just in general, is there a concern that is raised when uh, you go from uh, four uh, dominant players in a market to three? Uh, so I think as a general matter, you want as many competitors in a marketplace as possible. However, as I've said publicly before, there's not a magic number in any market. That's why it's so important to look at the econometrics and the facts of the, uh, of the case for any merging party. Um, because it could very well be that, you know, if there's enough competition and the barriers to entry are low, you know, a two to one has been found to have been okay uh, in certain markets because it's, it's really not, uh, new competition uh, is not limited and therefore there's major constraint on the pricing of effects of that, of that entity post-merger. So we're looking at all angles of this. Obviously, barriers to entry is an important element. Um, uh, the pricing powers are an important element uh, as are applied in our merger guidelines. Uh, but you know, I think as a general matter, I think it's fair to say the more competitors in any market is positive, but that doesn't mean less competitors automatically um, is doomed by the merger laws. You, uh, it, it, when it comes to the big tech platforms, the Googles, the Amazons, mm -hmm. uh, and Facebook, do you feel like you have taken more of a cautious approach as opposed to some of the rhetoric that we're hearing? Um, I don't know if I've taken, I think I've taken an appropriate approach. Uh, it's really easy to get a headline by saying, you know, X, company X is bad because they're, they're too big, because it's very popular to say that. Um, but I think we have to be very, we have to be responsible because our actions will affect business behavior down the road. You know, it's, you know, antitrust um, is, is such where uh, businesses follow recent enforcement actions and their activity conforms to that, um, even though you're not enforcing against every single company when you, when you take action or you know, announce policies about antitrust law, 
it affect business conduct. And we want to be sure that we don't harm that. That is, that is really important. That's why you know, reg we should be very careful about just broader government regulation in the industry. Uh, I think the country has benefited quite a bit. Look at the innovation we have in this country compared to many others uh, without the need of government intervention. And I think that's a, uh, that's a strong suit of this country and we should continue to do that. The important part is making sure antitrust enforcement gets in early before there's a problem with failure in the marketplace. I mean, as it exists right now, that tech platforms exist right now, can you envision a scenario where, where you, the remedy would be a divest, divestiture? Uh, you, you brought up the rhetoric of breaking up some of these companies, but, uh, but is that a real possibility? If, if the facts and the evidence lead to that, sure. I don't see that as, a, uh, as in, inhibiting. We have to be very careful, though, uh, about what it is. You know, what, what have they done? We brought an action, you know, it was a merger that had closed, um, but we demanded a divestiture after we learned of some evidence of anti-competitive harm that wasn't uh, brought to our attention just last year. So it, it was not in the platform area. It was an industrial field. But um, I don't see, you know, uh, I see divestiture as a potential remedy, but we have to be very sure about that that's the right a con action to take in remedying a conduct. We first got to have to define what the violation is. Uh, since I'm from Variety, I wanted to bring up a content question. Uh, AT&T, Time Warner, uh, you went to court, obviously, to challenge that uh, merger and awaiting a decision from uh, the DC Circuit in that case. Uh, in the industry, there is some concern talking to content creators over, for example, one of the big tech platforms buying a, a major content studio. Mm -hmm. would, would that raise similar concerns for you that you had with AT&T Time Warner? After all, you're talking about a major distributor buying a content player. Um, it, 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 I guess the easy answer is it could. It depends on the facts. Uh, but uh, remember, uh, in, in uh, AT&T Time Warner, we didn't have a problem with AT&T despite its distribution uh, uh, reach with DirecTV, UVerse, and AT&T Wireless owning Warner Brothers Studios. That wasn't a part yeah. of the transaction at all. So we think actually th there were very good pro-competitive arguments for that element of the transaction where you can do, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can actually uh, lower cost to consumers, provide new offerings, you know, give away free, I don't know, whatever it is, um, create new products with a lot of the old shows and new shows that Warner Brothers produces as one of the premier studios. So that wasn't a problem. And even HBO Cinemax, which was the second business, was, was not a real problem uh, unless it was combined with a broadcast business, the, the leverage that it created to allow for either increased prices or a shutdown, uh, which we have seen. So um, that, that example should say that it doesn't necessarily mean it is a problem. It depends on the competitive landscape. Um, you know, content production, uh, the cost of content production with the advent of technology has gone down quite a bit. So it changes the economic analysis than it was just 10 years ago. You can go out and make a movie for less than 20,000 uh, bucks nowadays and make a pretty darn good quality movie. So that's a factor, you know, when you're, of course. If you're measuring, measuring absolutely. the marketplace. And, and competition in the marketplace, absolutely, that's a factor. Uh, I think we may have time for uh, uh, one or two questions. I wanted to see if anyone had anything. Right here. Thanks so much, Ted. Um, this might be a long shot for getting a response from you, but the administration, um, I think, is increasingly, with expansions to CFIUS, uh, looking at um, potential national security threats that might come from investments in U.S. companies from foreign companies such as China. Um, do you have any thoughts on whether this, uh, or, or any, any thoughts on, on how the DOJ is weighing in with the CFIUS process um, around cybersecurity threat? Oh, uh, I'm Maureen back from Inside Cybersecurity. As you know, the, the CFIUS review is, uh, you know, chaired the Department of Treasury with an interagency uh, process in the Justice Department through our National Security Division 
uh, weighs in on transactions. I don't know if there's any increased um, uh, necessarily focus. It's, I think it's an appropriate focus about uh, you know, uh, foreign investments. Um, but as you know, the laws changed just this past year uh, in a bipartisan manner to expand the scope of the CFIUS review. Um, I just note that beyond that, there's not, not much else that I can add uh, uh, to the review. Each one is very specific and fact-based. So back here. Uh, Mark McCarthy with uh, SIIA in Georgetown. A lot of people are saying these days that privacy is an antitrust issue. W what do you say? Is privacy an antitrust issue? Boy, uh, we can teach a whole class for a year at, at Georgetown and still not have an answer to that question. Um, privacy is an important factor. Obviously, it plays into the issue of data and who can collect data, what, what factor uh, should data play in an antitrust analysis? Um, I've spoken uh, on the issue of data. I uh, have certain views about that. I think that you know some people equate personal uh, information to currency in, in, in evaluating um, uh, the antitrust implications in, in the new markets. And I have a, a view that I expressed at a, at a speech at the University of Haifa uh, most recently, uh, but also other commentary about that, that I don't know if that's the appropriate way of looking at it. If I had uh, you know, $10 and it, you know, I had to give away a dollar for a product uh, each time, I can only do that 10 times. Um, but I can provide my information uh, to infinite number of sources who ask for my name, my email, my cell phone number, uh, if I so choose to provide that in exchange for that. I think there's a good debate going on about you know, uh, privacy protection, what consumers should expect. Uh, and, and that's a proper debate in, in Congress. But the issue certainly dovetails through the issue of market power through data uh, for antitrust. Uh, we have taken action in the past in a merger enforcement where data is viewed as a property, uh, not in and of itself. I'm not a huge fan uh, of you know, forcing companies to share the data that they have collected just because it would create more competition. I don't think that's an appropriate view of the antitrust laws. Um, but it could certainly play in a, you know, uh, in a depending on a remedy if there has been a, a a proven link to that and a violation of, let's say, Section 2 of the Sherman Act. But I think we got to be uh, very careful about how we look at data, how it's collected, because the nature of this type of data that is being collected by these platforms uh, is such where, you know, some people call it non rivalrous It's not exclusive. You can just give it to as many people without a di diminution of cost to you. Uh, and and the, the methods of collecting such data by new businesses and new business models is getting cheaper and cheaper with new technology. So um, many people can, can invest in collecting such data that helps improve products. Do you think that if there is some um, major privacy legislation that will kind of tamp down uh, some of the concerns over antitrust? Uh, in other words, it goes kind of hand in hand. If there is some bill that's passed uh, that will solve, so to speak? I don't, I don't know if it will uh, solve some of the concerns about antitrust. Depends what it ultimately looks like. But my, my biggest concern about privacy legislation, as, as is with most other government regulation or legislation, uh, those with you know, the incumbents in a marketplace usually would like to shape that legislation to give them power. So it actually creates a moat around their market power and and increase the cost of any new entrant, new competition from coming in. So I think we need to be careful about how we craft those things, um, any kind of regulation, but particularly privacy, so that those who have it do not block out those who do not and cannot then compete. So it doesn't become a barrier to entry. And that is the biggest concern for, I think, uh, that I would say the policymakers should, should be concerned about as they consider privacy legislation. Another question right here. 
Thanks. Uh, Carl Zabo with NetChoice. Uh, first of all, good news. Uh, Senator Rubio's bill actually has specific recognition and privacy for small businesses and making sure they can get into the market. But uh, you spoke a lot about the importance and benefits of consumer welfare, not only here, but in other talks. Why do you consider consumer welfare to be the best standard? And are there problems in a move away from consumer welfare, which we've seen advocated by other groups and individuals? So why do I think consumer welfare is the, uh, is the best standard? Uh, it's the most principled one, ultimately, for the goal. I mean, uh, the purpose, I think, of antitrust law, ultimately, is making sure that you know, it's really a, a mechanism by, for policing the free marketplace and letting competition be the real uh, 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 determinant of what price is ultimately to the consumer. And whenever you have increase in output or decrease in price, that's a positive thing. But the consumer welfare standards, even broader than that, it looks to uh, you know, uh, innovation choice, quality of a product, and all of those are factors uh, that shouldn't be discounted for consumer welfare. I think some of the other discussions, I don't know what the standards are. The other standard that I've heard about is a public interest test. Well, a merger is not in the public interest. Well, what the heck does that mean? It means whoever's sitting in my chair or three people sitting at the FTC determine what that is. That's not a good guide for the business community, for certainty of allocation of capital. And I would uh, strongly urge against any implementation of a public interest test. As we've seen, we've had experience in other agencies and other uh, statutory constructs where you say, do this in the public interest. Well, what the heck is that? That's just a very lazy way of punting a real tough question. And I think the laws have developed in a way that have ultimately uh, led to good free markets. Yeah, are there challenges? Yeah, are there cases we lose? Yeah. Uh, is it tough to prove that? Um, it is. You know, is it, would it be easier for antitrust enforcers if the burden of proof is on you know, merging parties? Of course it would be. Uh, is there a different legal standard that would be better? Perhaps, but I think the balance is well struck and it has uh, withstood the test of time. And I think that's one where, on both sides of the ideological spectrum, as we've seen in testimony before Congress, consumer welfare standard is, uh, is advocated uh, you know, at the American Antitrust Institute uh, or the you know, uh, business roundtable. You, you, know, you don't get two, two, two different groups. Yeah, yeah. So both sides of the Both support that. And I think that's um, and, 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 you know, very uh, uh, influential economists from Carl Shapiro at, at Berkeley. Uh, who used to be the chief economist, both in the Obama and Clinton administration, to Dennis Carlton, who was a chief economist um, uh, at University, of, you know, was in the University of Chicago, was in the Bush administration, uh, to you know Luke Frobe, who was our chief economist most recently back at Vanderbilt. So I think there's broad agreement uh, about how to approach that. Uh, do we have time for another question? I think we do. Are you okay? I'm fine. Sure. We're just catching up with the emails. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions out here? I think you're well exhausted. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Great. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dad. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.